Hello, I'm Beth Wiggins from the Federal Judicial Center. When the Center held a workshop on Chapter 9 bankruptcy, issues surrounding pension and post-employment benefits were front and center in the discussion. We've asked an expert on that topic, Larry LaRose, to guide us through the important points judges need to understand in handling these matters. Larry is a partner in Norton Rose Fulbright, based in New York City, and leads their municipal restructuring practice. He's played a major role in nearly every significant Chapter 9 case in recent memory, including Detroit, Jefferson County, Alabama, Stockton, San Bernardino, and Vallejo, and currently represents a major creditor group in Puerto Rico. He's been named a leading lawyer in this area by the Legal 500 every year for the past six years. Larry earlier walked us through the intricacies of municipal financing, and that program is on the Center's intra and internet sites. I highly recommend it to you. But for now, welcome back, Larry, and thank you for being here today to talk about pension and other post-employment benefits. Well, thank you, Beth. Nice to see you again. You too. Um, to start, can you explain why pension issues are just so prominent in Chapter 9 cases? Yeah, sure. Well, Beth, as you know, municipalities are not only governments, they're also employers, and they're major employers in many cases. Um, the employees in municipalities provide all sorts of services to the citizens, like police, fire, transportation departments, teachers, uh, and personnel in hospitals and other parts of the system. Municipal employees participate in a variety of pension plans and are entitled to a variety of benefits. Usually these pension plans are called defined benefit plans. Um, but they're also entitled to other post-employment benefits, sometimes called OPEB, um, such as health care. And all of these things must be funded by the municipality on a regular basis. Notably, most of the benefits that are provided to these employees are under collective bargaining agreements, or CPAs, between the municipality and the labor unions. Employment, employees subject to a CBA are typically not eligible to participate in Social Security or Medicare, and the public pension plans themselves are exempt from ERISA and the PBGC. So employees and retiree costs are typically a huge, if not the largest, part of a municipal budget. So why is this such a big problem? Well, Beth, the magnitude of these liabilities at both the state and local level in this country is vast, and it's growing exponentially. Economists have estimated that looking at all state and municipal pension obligations in the aggregate, that pension obligations alone are more than two and a half times greater than the estimated market value of the assets that are funding these pension benefits. The unfunded portions of the pension obligations are more than three times the total outstanding public debt. Uh, when the city of Detroit, for example, filed for bankruptcy back in 2013, its pension plans were underfunded by almost 70%. When Puerto Rico filed for bankruptcy protection in 2017, its pension plan was underfunded by almost 98%. And as we sit here today, all of its pension assets have been depleted. It's totally unfunded. So currently, many large states have enormous general obligation debt, pension, and OPAB obligations. And when you combine them all together, they're more than 50% of their annual revenues. And these are important states, Illinois, New Jersey, Hawaii, Connecticut, Kentucky. So unless states and municipalities can get these liabilities under control through either tax increases or other means, it's going to be inevitable that they'll have to cut services or going to need a federal bailout. So that's why, no matter where we live, these issues are important to everyone. It's literally a ticking time bomb. Well, let's, let's step back to something you said early. You said that municipal employees typically participate in defined benefit plans. What does this mean, and how does state law affect the status of such plans? Sure. Well, as I said, public pensions are typically defined benefit plans. While these are increasingly rare in the private sector, a defined benefit plan is funded by municipal contributions of assets into the plan and a promise to an employee that he or she will be paid a set amount of payments during retirement without regard to the actual value of assets under the plan. It's a fixed mm -hmm. promise. The legal status of these plans and those promises differ under state law. Traditionally, most states treated public pension plans as either gratuities or gifts. That meant that the city or town 
could change the promise at any time because those promises were not vested and lawmakers could and did change them on a regular basis. But currently, only two states, Indiana and Texas, continue to follow that approach. Every other state uh, either adopts a contract approach or a property approach to pension promises. Under the contract approach, pension uh, are considered to be a contractual obligation between the employee and the municipality. The only significant questions are when that contract contractual obligation actually vests and what are the terms. So under this approach, pension rights are protected under the contracts clause of the U.S. Constitution and similar clauses in state constitutions. Now many states, including Michigan, uh, have, have incorporated this contractual promise actually into their own state constitutions. Six states uh, interpret pension promises a little different. They interpret them as creating a vested property interest. Now, participants in plans in these states can challenge any changes and adjustments to the pension promises under the takings and due process clauses of the U.S. Constitution. Okay. Well, so is there any way to adjust the obligations under such plans to get under control the increasing, perhaps unsustainable magnitude of the liability? Well, given the growing and, as you say, perhaps unsustainable burden uh, that these promises have placed on states and municipalities, uh, a number of them, uh, most notably and unsuccessfully Illinois recently, <coughs> have attempted to adjust their obligations through new state legislation. Uh, the general outcomes from these attempts uh, have been mixed. Uh, under either this, the contract or the property approach, accrued benefits really cannot be effectively altered under state law. Different promises can be made to new employees, but existing employee promises generally have to remain intact. A few states and localities uh, have been successful in, in, in altering uh, not yet accrued benefits to existing employees, but these adjustments are really relatively minor. Okay. So what's the state law with respect to other post-employment benefit plans? The same as for pension plans? Well, as I said, uh, uh, Beth, OPEB obligations are generally created under CPAs, and so therefore they're contracts of employment uh, and are almost always unfunded. It's very rare to find a, a funded OPEB plan. While contractually based, the contracts generally have defined termination dates and thus lack the state law protections afforded to pension plans that we just discussed. Okay. Well, that brings us to Chapter 9. Um, can you refresh our memory before we get into the details about the basic legal framework in play here? Oh, sure. So, uh, as we discussed uh, well, previously, Chapter 9 is the provisions of the Bankruptcy Code that are applicable to mun municipalities. Mm -hmm. It does not apply to states. But the fundamental principle supporting Chapter 9 is that municipalities are creatures of the states, and the states themselves are sovereign under federal law in the U.S. Constitution. Mm -hmm. So a, a municipality cannot file under Chapter 9 unless the state which created it explicitly authorizes it to do so. About half of the states have done this in one form or another. So under Chapter 9, the bankruptcy court is prohibited from, in fact, interfering with the, the municipality's political and governmental functions, and it cannot require the municipality to raise taxes or cut its budget. Notwithstanding this, the U.S. Constitution does remain fully applicable in Chapter 9, and it creates, uh, and it states, I should say, in the Supremacy Clause, uh, that the, the Constitution and laws of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. In addition, the Bankruptcy Clause of the Constitution states that Congress shall not have the power to establish I'm sorry, Congress shall have the power to establish <laughs> through uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States. Okay. Now, within this legal framework, two bankruptcy courts have in fact considered whether pension promises can be restructured in Chapter 9. Okay, so I think the two cases are Detroit and Stockton, right? right. And right. Um, So can we start with Detroit? Sure. Well, in Detroit, which is of course in Michigan, the Michigan Constitution expressly protects pensions, and it protects them as contractual obligations. It says, quote, these are contractual obligations, quote, which shall not be diminished or impaired, close quote. Mm -hmm. So retirees, unions, and others in the case argued strongly from the beginning of the case that the so-called so pension clause in the Michigan Constitution prohibited the bankruptcy court from impairing any accrued pension benefits. Now, 
given the severe underfunding of the destroyed pension plans, as I mentioned earlier, they're underfunded by over 70 percent, the potential liability was huge, over three and a half billion dollars. And thus the question of whether or not Detroit's pensions could be restructured and its liabilities reduced through Chapter 9 was a gating issue in the case. Mm -hmm. So Judge Rhodes, who over overlooked the bankruptcy, in his opinion on eligibility of Detroit to file under Chapter 9, uh, expressly determined that, quote, the state constitutional provisions prohibiting the impairment of contracts and pensions impose no constraints on the bankruptcy process, close quote. He looked to the Supremacy Clause and the Bankruptcy Clause, the U.S. Constitution, and held that those clauses trump state law in this particular circumstance. So thus, there is no legal prohibition to impairing pensions under Chapter 9. Judge Rhodes concluded that impairing contractual rights is what the bankruptcy process mm -hmm. does. Okay. So what happened in the Stockton case? Well, in, in Stockton, unlike Michigan, California does not have a constitutional provision protecting pensions, but state statutory and case law does in California. Um, in that case, the California Public Employees Retirement System, sometimes called CalPERS, uh, which administers many of the public employee pension plans in California, argued uh, that pension promises could not be impaired in bankruptcy under, under California state law and the Contracts Clause of the, of the U.S. Constitution and the California Constitution. In his opinion on plan confirmation, Judge Klein uh, in the Stockton case rejected all of CalPERS' arguments, citing the Supremacy Clause and the Bankruptcy Clause as trumping state law. Judge Klein determined that, quote, first, the California statute forbidding rejection of, of CalPERS contract in a Chapter 9 case is constitutionally infirm in the face of the exclusive power of Congress to enact uniform bankruptcy laws. Second, the lien granted to CalPERS by a state statute is vulnerable to avoidance in bankruptcy. And third, the contracts clauses of the federal and the state constitution do not preclude contract rejection or modification in bankruptcy. So, Judge Klein concluded very clearly on this point, hence, in a ma as a matter of law, the city's pension administration contract with CalPERS, as well as the city's sponsored pensions themselves, may be adjusted as part of a Chapter 9 plan. Okay. Well, Michigan and California both follow the contract approach regarding the status of public pensions, right? Yeah. So do you think the outcome would be different in a state that followed the property approach? Well, yeah, while both Michigan and California do follow a contract approach, and the bankruptcy court analysis have followed from that, there is no case interpreting the property approach. But I don't believe the result would be any different under that approach. Under the property approach, the argument is that adjustment of vested pension obligations under Chapter 9 without compensation results in an unconstitutional taking of property under the Fifth Amendment. But in Fifth Amendment cases, the Supreme Court has made clear that it seeks to prevent not all takings, but takings of property to the extent of a claimant's investment-backed expectations in the property. Pension beneficiaries in, in the states uh, that we've seen appear to have a solid argument that there's a property interest in funded portion of their pension benefits. Mm -hmm. The question is whether the property interest extends the unfunded portion as well. While it's not free from doubt, I believe it's unlikely that a court would make that extension. Uh, a beneficiary of a partially funded pension plan is functionally no different than a partially secured creditor in bankruptcy. While property rights attach to the extent of collateral of a secured creditor, they don't extend to the deficiency claim, which is completely unsecured. Mm -hmm. It's important to note that pension plans do differ, however, from pledge collateral in an important respect. There is no formal mechanism like the UCC for perfecting a security interest or property right in pension funds. If identifiable assets have been set aside and segregated from other public funds, it's likely that a court will conclude, though, that pension beneficiaries have a protected property interest in those assets, mm -hmm. and only the unfunded portion of the pension obligation is subject to restructuring. That was the case in both Detroit and Stockton. Now, in stark contrast, we have Puerto Rico, which depleted virtually all of its pension plan assets before filing for bankruptcy, 
and has now totally unfunded plans and unfunded claims. So let's jump back to OPEP obligations. What have the bankruptcy courts decided about their status? Well, if, um, as we discussed previously, OPEB obligations generally are created under CBAs. They're totally unfunded, and they lack the same protections afforded to pensions under state law. In the city of Vallejo Chapter 9 case, which actually preceded the Stockton case, the bankruptcy court, which was then upheld by the district court on appeal, applied a 1984 Supreme Court decision called NLRB versus Bildesco to determine whether a debtor, in this case Vallejo, could unilaterally assume or reject a CBA in bankruptcy. In the Bildisco case, the Supreme Court held that a debtor can, subject to a showing that the agreement burdens the estate and that the equities balance in favor of rejection. Application of the Bildesco standard in Chapter 9 uh, was and remains significant because after Bildesco was decided, Congress enacted Bankruptcy Code Sections 1113 mm -hmm. and 1114 that set forth new and higher standards uh, and procedures for rejecting CBAs and restructuring benefits under Chapter 11. The Vallejo Court held that such provisions do not apply at all in Chapter 9. So both of the Stockton and Detroit cases built on the Vallejo reasoning, and in Stockton, Judge Klein embraced Bill Desco and used that standard for CBA rejection and also denied a claim that the rejection violated the contracts clause of the U.S. and the California constitutions. Judge Klein reasoned that the contracts clause bars a state from making a law impairing the obligations of contract, but it does not bar Congress from doing so. And in Detroit, Judge Rhodes endorsed Judge Klein's analysis in all respects. Well, you've told us about the legal reasoning and the conclusions, but can you tell us how the employees actually fared in these cases? Yeah, that's a really good question, <laughs> because given the reasoning that we've just walked through and the way bankruptcy courts have addressed these issues, many observers have really expressed surprise at the actual treatment provided to claimants under the plans of adjustment that were confirmed in these cases. Uh, in Detroit, for example, pensions were impaired by only 3 to 4 percent. That compares to, uh, but that also had other adjustments to uh, certain investment plans by payments. But in contrast, unsecured claimants in the Detroit case were impaired by 24 to 98 percent. Mm -hmm. In both Stockton and Vallejo, pensions were completely unimpaired, while general unsecured claims were severely impaired. But in all three cases, OPEB obligations, that primarily, primarily health care benefits, were treated as unsecured claims and received minimal recoveries, resulting in hundreds of millions of dollars of future benefits to public employees being impaired. Well, certainly not the outcomes one would expect. So why these outcomes? Yeah, well, Beth, you know, the reason for these outcomes is really inherent in the process. While Chapter 9 is a legal proceeding, of course, but there is a general consensus that is also an inherently political process, which requires a careful balancing between the powers of the court and the local government and sovereigns involved. So the court cannot compel the government to seek to impair pensions or OPEB obligations, even if the government may legally do so under the current standards. The only power that the bankruptcy court can wield in this process is the power to confirm or dismiss a Chapter 9 plan as proposed by the municipality. It's important to understand, I think, that while the legal standards <coughs> that must be met for a plan of adjustment to be confirmed are thorough and bankruptcy courts take these standards seriously, there really is inherent leeway in that process. Mm -hmm. While the Chapter 9 debtor must show that the plan is feasible, that it's in the best interest of all creditors and contains no unfair discrimination among creditors, the ultimate findings on confirmation issues will be influenced by the process undertaken in the case. For example, in Detroit, that process which involved extensive mediation among the various claimant groups, resulted in a fully consensual plan that was agreed mm -hmm. to by all major creditor constituencies and classes. In fact, because there were, in fact, no objections to the proposed plan, Judge Rhodes in Detroit mm -hmm. had to engage his own third-party expert to provide testimony and analysis at the confirmation hearing on certain confirmation standards. The outcome for pensions in Detroit was really driven by what was called the so-called grand bargain in that case, 
which saw hundreds of millions of dollars of third-party contributions, mm -hmm. mostly from five private foundations, effectively donated to the pension plans to, to reach, to resolve that case. It's a very sui generis, and I think it's unlikely that we'd see that in any other case. In Stockton, confirmation was opposed by only one creditor, and Judge Klein easily found that when looking at employee benefit impairment as a whole, including the OPEB impairment, the plan did not unfairly discriminate against unsecured creditors, even if the pension plans were left unimpaired. Okay. Well, I can't help but ask, since you've been in Puerto Rico and are involved there, what do you think is going to happen in those cases? Well, the treatment of employee benefits under any proposed plan of adjustment proposed in the Puerto Rico case is really unknown and completely mm -hmm. unknowable at this time. But I, I think it can be observed that the debtors in those cases, and remember, it's a federal control mm -hmm. board that is technically the debtors, they have proposed a 10% cut to vested pensions. But you must understand that these pensions are currently 100% unfunded, okay? Uh, even this small cut of 10% is being vigorously resisted by the Puerto Rico uh, Commonwealth government highlighting the inherently political nature of these types of legal processes and the outcomes in that case is, as I said, unknowable. Okay. Well, so Larry, where does that leave us? What are the major points you'd like to make now? Okay, just, I, I, think, I think we can sum up here by saying non-binding bankruptcy case law mm -hmm. and the general consensus of the legal and academic community on these issues is that unfunded pensions and OPEB obligations may be impaired through a Chapter 9 plan of adjustment. But the legal issue is not free from doubt, and constitutional and state law issues, including the constitutionality of Chapter 9 itself, are likely to be vigorously contested if there is a non-consensual attempt to impair these obligations through Chapter 9. Indeed, I believe the confirmation process in the Puerto Rico Title III cases, which, remember, incorporate or mirror most of the relevant provisions of Chapter 9, could be just such a case. Uh, and the issues could go all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court at some point. Mm -hmm. The consensus also is that a court cannot force a municipal debtor to impair pensions or employee benefits if it is not inclined to do so for political or any other reason. Mm -hmm. The most that a court can do is fail to approve a plan of adjustment proposed by the municipality and dismiss the case. But experience really does suggest that this outcome will be a rare instance, and courts will exercise their discretion and flexibility in plan confirmation pr proceedings to really encourage consensual results. Thus, I think, Beth, that we can conclude that Chapter 9 is really not a silver bullet for curing municipal pension mm -hmm. and benefit woes, but it should be and is, I believe, available as an option to those municipalities with both the legal eligibility and the political <coughs> will to use it. Thank you, Larry, for this fabulous overview on the state of the law. And also, thank you for the help you've given us over the past two years in understanding Chapter 9 issues generally. Thank you, Beth. It's been a pleasure.